hello, my friends, and welcome to the Seeds and Weeds podcast, brought to you by Small House Farm. If you're looking to celebrate plants and the people that love them, then this is the podcast for you. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen. Hey, everybody. Our show today is just packed full of awesome stuff. We're playing This or That with John Jackson. John is a veteran, a barbecue master, a pig farmer, and owner of Comfort Farms in Georgia. Today, we're going to make John choose between some of his favorite things. But before that, we're going to be checking in with Enoch Graham from the popular YouTube channel The Urban Gardener for a segment that I'm calling Ask a Gardener. Enoch will be answering all of your garden-related questions, and then we're going to wrap things up today with my review of the new book, Urban Foraging, by Lisa M. Rose. So be sure to stick around for that. Now, before we get started today, though, I just really want to say thank you to everybody that has supported the show so far. I've just been loving your emails, your Instagram messages, comments on YouTube. I don't know. However you're reaching out to us, I just want to say thank you. You know, putting together this podcast, it's hard work, so I really do appreciate all of the feedback and an extra big thank you to those of you that have decided to support the program through our patreon page if you enjoy the podcast and want to support us even for as little as three dollars a month the link is patreon.com slash small house farm you can always find that link uh, down in the show notes or on our website which is seeds and weeds podcast.com thanks again everybody Enoch Graham is gardening in Southern Oregon, where he's developed a love for growing food in small urban spaces, utilizing containers and elevated beds. He started the popular YouTube channel, The Urban Gardener, to share his gardening adventures through his many videos, in the garden and on the road visiting other gardeners. Today, Enoch is joining us for a quick round of Ask the Gardener, where he'll be answering your questions and helping you to have larger harvests and more fun in the garden. Enoch, thank you so much for being on the show today, man. You're welcome, Bevan. It's great to be here with you. It's all my pleasure. So what we're going to do today is a little thing I like to call Ask the Gardener. Folks have sent in their uh, gardening questions, and we are going to ask you to help us answer them. How does that sound? Okay, it sounds great. All right, before we get started, how about you tell everybody that's listening a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? Well, uh, of course, uh, my name is Enoch Graham, and I'm from Southern Oregon, and I live in uh, Medford, just right outside of the city here. And And um, about a dozen years ago, I started gardening in uh, kind of my back patio on a rooftop of my carport. And I just started getting crazy with it and started taking up the alleyway space. And um, neighbors started noticing what uh, I was doing there and thought, you know what, if we're going to be teaching people around the neighborhood what I'm doing with small spaces, why not start a YouTube channel and make some videos and show people? So that's what I've been doing over the last uh, five years now, uh, showing videos on small space gardening. All right. So the first question they sent in right here is what are some tips and tricks that you can recommend to gardeners to extend their growing season, either through the winter or maybe in the early spring? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Be in winter now. um, We're uh, kind of utilizing different things to kind of cover stuff up. So like uh, back in the fall, uh, I've got a couple of trees in my front yard. So I try to utilize the stuff I have around me. So those trees are dropping a lot of leaves. And so what I'll do is I'll mulch all those up and cover up most all of my spaces and really kind of snug a lot of those plants in. And then as it starts to get colder into the season, I'll cover things up. And so if I've got some in-ground spaces, we'll make little hoops with some PVC and cover them with some plastic sheeting. And then I try to kind of imitate the same thing with some of my elevated beds. So we try to cover them up, you know, make kind of some cold frames, try to keep them in the so, warm as possible, I suppose. Uh, we live here at Small House. We're kind of on the edge of the woods too. So we have a lot of leaves, uh, which is, you know, free, a free gift from nature. It makes a perfect mulch. It is. It's one of the best. And if you uh, mulch them really well too, it's what I've found is that they break down really easily. And those decomposed leaves, they feed the soil too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Create that soil life. That's the best thing for your garden. So Enoch, what are some of your favorite perennial garden crops and why? Okay. Well, um, for me though, again, I live in the city and I actually rent, but I do kind of have a little bit of a herb garden. So we've got a lot of different perennial herb and my main perennials are actually some painter fruit trees that I grow. What size containers do you have these trees in? Um, most of my trees are probably around seven gallons. I do wish I had the in-ground space again, 
for uh, lots and lots of fruit trees. That's definitely something that I recommend for any uh, gardener if you got the space. Absolutely. Okay. Now, aside from the trees, fruit trees, what are some uh, easy and productive crops that you might recommend for a beginner gardener to try? For beginner gardeners to try, um, they're really getting started and want to try it real simple. I would start with peas if it's the cooler season. Thing with some spinach and radishes. Those things are really great. And uh, also, I like a lot of different kale. I'm one of those weird guys who likes kale. So those are good things to get started with. I'm going to second that with the radishes for sure. I love growing radishes, just kind of tucking seeds in everywhere that I go throughout the whole spring when I'm planting stuff. And then, you know, what is it, 30 days, you get some radishes to eat. And if you forget them and you miss them, you get the radish pods to eat later. So it's a kind of a win-win. And you know what? If you're also trying out and wanting to save seeds, I think uh, radishes are one of those great ones all the way around from growing like you said, collecting the seed pods uh, early for uh, eating. And then later on, uh, as they mature, they're a great one to save seeds and regrow. Absolutely. So that's, we're going to segue with that right into the next question, Enoch. Um, where do you like to source high quality seeds from? Yeah, um, I like to try different uh, different companies. But one of the ones that I really keep coming back to are High Mowing, Fedco, or a couple. I did a video actually on my channel where I did the top 10 seed catalogs. And um, actually, the number one for me is uh, Baker Creek. I'm a big fan of Baker Creek, too. I actually, this last year, um, got really into Asian greens, just like you were talking about how you like all those different types of kale. Um, I'm the same way. I love growing greens. And Baker Creek has a great selection of different greens. So I bought, well, far more than I needed, um, but I just wanted to try them all, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's really something that we all do. I, I, I highlight too many and end up buying so many different varieties. All right. Now, the last question here, Enoch, what advice do you have for beginning gardeners that are just getting started? Excellent question. Excellent question. Keep it simple, grow what you eat, and start a garden journal too. That's another thing I would recommend. That way you can keep notes on those sort of things and be able to build on different things that you're learning as you go along. So I would say keep it simple, grow what you eat, start a garden journal, and of course, have fun. Have fun. You know, don't let some of those plant failures get you down. You know, uh, have fun with gardening. Enjoy it. You got it, man. Well, thank you so much, Enoch, for sitting in for Ask a Gardener with us today. So folks, they're looking to connect with you. Um, how are they going to find you? What's your YouTube channel? What are the links that we need to click to be able to get more of you in our life? Uh, my uh, YouTube channel is The Urban Gardener. And uh, come and join me on my YouTube garden adventure and follow along as we continue growing. We've got some great things coming up this next season. Fantastic, Enoch. And I'm going to put those uh, links in the show notes, like you mentioned, for sure. Thank you again for doing this, man. You have a great day now. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Devin. It's been a pleasure. I am pretty excited about this next guest, so let's get right into it. John Jackson is an Army veteran turned pig farmer and founder of Stag Vets, the world's first acute veterans crisis agriculture center at Comfort Farms in Georgia. Today, John is joining us on the show for a quick game of this or that. John Jackson, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Glad to be here, Bevan. Glad to be here. So before we get started, how about you tell the folks at home a little bit about who you are and the work that you do? Okay. Yeah. So my name is uh, John Jackson. I was uh, born in Jersey, right across from the uh, the Twin Tower Statue Statue of Liberty and um, New York skyline. Those towers went down during 9-11 and I decided to go to war. Pretty much I knew what I was signing myself up for. You know, I didn't come from an overly uh, patriotic family. You know, my mom is uh, African born and, um, you know, refugee over to this country um, in the late 60s, uh, early 70s. And my dad Dad is old Southern boy from Georgia, you know, who who moved up to New York and they met. And so um, I had a pretty diverse family and, um, you know, or uh, I would kind of call it weird culinary wise and culturally wise, deep south and straight out of Africa. So it was uh, pretty interesting. But I went to war and got injured. Um, and through that, um, decorated uh, United States Army Ranger, uh, medically retired. And I started a nonprofit called Stag Vets Inc. And uh, with that, we started a program called Comfort farms where we help transitioning vets get back into farming or use farming as a way for their transition to uh, get back to civilian life. Man, that's awesome, John. That's a great story. Okay, so we're going to do a little thing today that I call this or that. I'm going to give you two options and then you have to choose either this or that and then tell us why. How's that sound? Uh, it sounds good. Go ahead for it. 
All right, John. So now you've become pretty well known for your skills on the grill, and you've even recently launched your own line of barbecue sauce. So, John Jackson, what do you choose, pork or beef? Ooh, I choose pork, <laughs> and I'll, t- I'll tell you why. Um, because I grew up in a pork culture, right? I, I grew up in a pork Southern culture. But the interesting thing is if I go back to my African lineage, pork wasn't involved. Beef was. But because I'm here in the South, pork is king. And the other reason why I, I really gravitate towards pork and my cooking styles with with my barbecue sauce, you know, Dick Jackson's barbecue and also the open fire flames is because pork has been noted as the poor man's food for so long. And I seek to elevate that to new standards. I raise my pork, uh, woodland pork, you know, not on pasture. They're in the woods. We rotate them with a beautiful woodland pork program that we have here. Um, I have three breeds that I created out of the American mule foot, which the Spanish breed brought in and there the kale kale the royal yabali and the um the piedmont black hog and those hogs are not supposed to be smoked to death with it which is traditionally how southern people like to do it we go back to uh the original way pork was consumed uh around the world in many places which is roasted and the reason why they were roasted because they had the genetic ability to have the uh, imf in- intramuscular fat to actually um self base the meat as it's going over high flames and you can't do that with commodity pork today there's hardly any fat because of the whole no fat movement and um and our animals have suffered because of that but uh prior to the industrialization of food people ate really good and part of that was uh was eating really really good pork you look at these old black women in the south and even old poor white folks in the south they had a heavy heavy diet of bacon and nobody uh died of a heart attack or had high cholesterol issues. Uh, They thrive because they ate good food. I love it. Throw me another one. (laughs) All right, here's the next one. Through your work now, you found some interesting ways to highlight the connections between food and culture. Mm. So what do you pick? Beans or greens? Ooh. (laughs) I got to go with greens. I got to go with greens. Um, uh, Man, beans are beans are right there, too. But uh, but greens, greens, really. Um, One of the reasons as I start going through my culture, one of the things that fascinate me is how, you know, Africans. Right. um, There's a difference between, let's say, the American diet, the African diet and then the or the African-American diet and then the African diet. Right. And so uh, the African diet is based on bottom tier. The foundation is all greens. There's no grain. There's no bread. There's nothing in there. It's just all greens. And so it's funny because as I start to uh, work with many different uh, cultures from Africa who come to my farm, they expose me to so many different types of greens that they've eaten from Kenya, from uh, Tanzania, you know, um, from West Africa. You know, I didn't know pumpkin greens was like a real thing. Let's talk about beans, you know, um, cowpea beans. You know, my my folks who speak Swahili who come to my farm, they buy the actual greens there and they call it kundi, you know, and they they prepare those greens. My mom grew up on sweet potato greens. Right. And then there's the, um, you know, famed collard greens. And so we start eating anything that has a brassica annotation to it. We eat it all. And um, it's absolutely delicious. So I, I love I love greens and how we prepare it. Uh, I do many different things from it. And since it's the cold, this is green season. So I'm heavy on that. Man, you're making me hungry. OK, next question. Farming's hard work, obviously, with each season kind of presenting its own particular challenges and chores and that sort of thing. So which would you choose, spring gardening or fall gardening? Ooh, that is a hard one. It's particularly hard because uh, down here in zone eight, we garden all year long and uh, both seasons are enjoyable. Man, um, I'm going to have to go with fall. Because it's less heat. It's a little bit more predictable. It's a lot more friendlier with uh, plants. And then I can uh, particularly get a second crop of my spring veg and to include tomatoes and all of my um, eggplants and uh, peppers. Not so much unless I do it in a greenhouse. All right. All right. Fair enough. Now, here's your last question. Farming, food and history are all ways that you've been able to connect with your community. But what's your choice? Farmers markets or community gardens? Mm. I stay away from farmers markets. 
um, even though I've created my own farmer's market on my farm. So I have an on-farm farmer's market, but community gardens seem to, if they do it right, community gardens are a way to impact the community at a very visceral level and get the impact that people need. So I I will lean more towards community gardens in the effect of having a little bit more impact if it's done right. Excellent. And that's all the questions that is this or that. Thank you so much for playing, John. Thanks, man. So if folks need to get a hold of you after this, how do they find you online so they can stay connected with your work? Hey, you guys can stay connected with me uh, through Comfort Farms on Facebook and on Instagram. Um, You can also follow me uh, through my muses at Dick Jackson's Barbecue. That's with an S, no apostrophe, Dick Jackson's Barbecue uh, dot com on Facebook. I'm just starting that up. Um, Hit me up, you know, through any of those media, send me a message and uh, I'll definitely get back to you. Sounds good. I'm going to put all those links down in the show notes too, so folks can find them. And uh, thanks for spending some time with us today, John. We really appreciate having you here. Hey, thanks a lot, Bevan, man. You're a great friend. Look forward to seeing you soon, buddy. Well, that was even more fun than I thought it was going to be. Thanks again to John for being on the show. I put all of his links, like I said, down in the show notes so you can check out what he's doing at Comfort Farms, find his Facebook, check out the barbecue sauce, whatever you're into, all the links are going to be there. Now, let's wrap things up today with a quick review on the new book from Timber Press, Urban Foraging from Lisa M. Rose. From cover to cover, Urban Foraging, the third book from Michigan herbalist Lisa M. Rose, is packed full of useful information and vibrantly stunning images. Following in the footsteps of her 2016 work, Midwest Foraging, Rose takes the reader on a journey through their neighborhood, helping them to identify the many useful herbs growing wild right in their area. For this book, however, she has stepped away from simply discussing the Midwest and created a book that can be enjoyed by readers no matter where they live. Rose's detailed writing is accompanied by the stellar camera work of Chicago-based photographer for Miriam Doan. The images on these pages leap into life with alluring colors and exquisite texture. Not only does Rose help us to find useful plants growing right outside of our door, she also shows us how to use them. Delicious recipes like wild apple tart tatin are peppered throughout the book, showcasing these locally found herbs in delightfully imaginative ways. Lisa Rose has shown us that nature's bounty is just outside our door. We really just need to look for her. And with a copy of Urban Foraging in hand, it's never been easier. And that's today's show. Thanks again for joining us. And remember, you can always support the podcast through our Patreon. You can find that link and many more at seedsandweedspodcast.com. Thanks again to John Jackson and Enoch Graham for being on the show today. This episode was edited and produced by all of us here at Small House Farm. And the music you're listening to right now is called Swing by Music for Videos. Thanks again for joining us. I'm Bevan Cohen. See you next time.